All right. Hello, everyone. Um, the room is open, so people are starting to trickle in. So we'll just give a few moments um, for them to, to get situated. Um, for this presentation, if you guys have any questions, we're going to hold off doing questions until the end of the session. Um, but you can submit them throughout the presentation by using the question and answer function. Um, and, and I'll um, filter through them and help deliver those questions at the end. All right, awesome. So without further ado and without eating up uh, more time, we have Professor Leslie Jones from Cardiff joining us for the next half an hour. Thank you for joining us, Leslie. Um, she is going to be giving us a talk on genetic mo modifiers in HD. So Professor Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, so as Jacqueline said, um, questions at the end, but um, I'm hoping that I can um, keep you with me during this talk. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'll just put my laser pointer on. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk to you about the work that we've been doing in collaboration with a lot of other people looking at genetic modifiers, um, really with the idea of being able to find new treatments for Huntington's disease, which um, of course we all need. So Huntington's disease, as you all know, is caused by an expanded um, CAG repeat in the Huntington gene. And this gives rise to an expanded glutamine tract in the protein though we do, don't know for sure that that glutamine tract actually causes the brain cells that die in the disease to die. So in, um, in, normal, in the normal population without Huntington's disease, um, the repeat is up to 26 CAG. Once it's above 26 CAG, there's a chance it could expand in the germline, but people with 26 to 35 CAGs don't normally um, get Huntington's disease. Um, but once the gene has expanded as far as 36 CAG, then um, people will get disease if they live long enough. There's a grey area between 36 and 40 CAGs that um, is not fully penetrant. So some people with 36 to 40 CAGs do not present with Huntington's disease in their lifetime. And as I'm sure you all know, and we'll have seen presented previously, um, at, by the time the disease is diagnosed, usually, but not always because of the presentation of motor symptoms, um, there's actually been quite a lot of cell death in the brain and quite a lot of um, other changes. So that um, there's a pre-manifest and what's called a prodromal phase, um, largely defined by the lovely work of Sarah Tabrizi, until people actually get um, a motor diagnosis and they're considered to have manifest disease. So there's this very long um, prodromal phase and it's not entirely clear how long that is um, in individuals, but it's generally considered to be around 10 years, um, perhaps a bit more in um, most people, but not everybody. But what we also know is that there's quite a lot of variation at in the age at which people are diagnosed with disease. And I'm going to come back to that. So why should we look for genetic modifiers in Huntington's disease? Well, we've known about the gene and its expanded CAG mutation as the cause of the disease since 1993. So that's, you know, going on for 30 years and it's taken us until now to have any prospect of a treatment and one of the reasons for this is that if you express that expanded CAG repeat in cells, in mice, in rats, in pigs, in sheep, people have expressed it in all sorts of places. If you express that repeat, and usually it's a very long repeat so that you can ensure that your model system produces some sort of um, effect that you can recognize and test, um, 
If you do that, then pretty well everything in those cells and those organisms will be different to the way it would have been had they not had that expanded repeat. And that means that it's very difficult to tell which of those things you need to put right in order to treat the disease. So the idea of going back and looking for genetic modifiers is the fact that this is completely agnostic to um, what we know about HD biology. It simply says, are there genes or variants in genes that people inherit that shift their age of onset and, or their symptom type? But I'm going to talk mostly about age of onset because that's where, what we've mostly been doing. So, all of you will have seen graphs like this. This one might look a little bit different simply because we've jittered the points so that you can see the individual points. So this is a plot of the CAG length against the age of motor onset. And you can see there's a very clear correlation between the um, age of motor onset and the repeat length. It's an inverse correlation. The longer the repeat, the earlier the onset of disease such that for someone with 40 repeats, on average, they'll get the disease in their, probably in their 50s. Someone with 50 repeats, on average, they'll get the disease in their 30s. But actually, what you can also see from this is that for any one repeat length, there's a huge range of um, different ages at which people get disease. So they can get this disease in their 20s and 30s, or they might get disease in their 80s. So what causes this? If we can understand what causes this, we might be able to move people with 41 repeats from down here to up here. And that would be a huge win. Even getting a little bit of the way up here would be a huge win. Um, so the reason for looking for genetics is that we know part of this difference in age of onset is inherited. So the CAG repeat length accounts for probably about 60% of the difference in age at onset um, between people, different people with Huntington's disease. But um, of the rest, about half of that is heritable, i.e. it's passed down in families. And that means that it must be um, due to differences in their genetics. So we decided that one way to go about this was to look for the genes and variants that might be causing this effect. So um, we did this and essentially what we're doing is we're saying um, we take away the, um, the expected age of onset from the actual age of onset. So then we have a number of people who have earlier onset than expected and a number of people who have later onset than expected. And this is called the residual age of onset. So this excludes the effect of the CAG repeat and we then plot those against variants throughout the genome and millions of variants and in the genome as um, actually most of you probably know because uh, most of you will know quite a bit about genetics I suspect across the genome there are variants um, all over it and usually they have um, two different um, types of DNA base, usually called alleles, and we can see whether those particular variants that, that at that particular site actually um, are associated with differences in the residual age of onset. So whether people have earlier or later onset than expected. And we can plot these on a graph that's known as a Manhattan plot. Now it's called a Manhattan plot because it looks like the Manhattan skyline apparently. Um, different ones have more or less resemblance to the Manhattan skyline. But basically this is a plot of the um, 22 autosomes in the human genome against minus log 10 of the p-value of that association of the residual age of onset with the individual variant that occurs at, at that point all the way through the genome. Now, we're doing lots and lots of tests here. So normally we would accept that um, if there was a chance of something occurring that was um, more than one in 20, then actually we would say that that was significant. But here, 
We're doing millions of tests, so we have to have a much higher threshold. And the threshold that we have is five times 10 to the minus eight. So that is um, eight noughts and a five after the decimal point. So that's pretty stringent, but you can see that we've got some signals here and basically signals are where the points come above the line. And those signals, we can identify where they are, which genes they're in, because we have a map of the human genome. And what we found in our first look at this, and this is our um, latest study, which includes um, over 9,000 subjects. And what we see is we see a lot of signals coming from genes that are involved in this process called mismatch repair. Mismatch repair goes on all the time in the genome because the genome is constantly attacked um, by all sorts of different effects, both internal, intrinsic and external, and these damage the DNA. And the damaged DNA has to be repaired. So it gets repaired by a number of different systems, but one of them is this mismatch repair system, which spots a base that is the wrong base, it's incorrectly paired. Um, it marks it, it takes it out and replaces it with the right one. And you'll notice that we've got one very striking signal here, a really big peak in a gene called FAN1. Now FAN1 is not a member of the mismatch repair machinery, but it is a nuclease, it cuts DNA. So we think that FAN1 and these mismatch repair genes might very well act together to alter the way the uh, repeat in the Huntington gene acts. We also found a number of other genes, which and we don't know what they do. They may have an effect on the same sort of mechanism as FAN1 and the mismatch repair genes, but they could be having other effects. And we don't know yet because we're still studying those genes. We also found a hit in Huntington itself, and it's not due to the CAG repeat per se, because uh, we took that out at the beginning. And the other interesting thing we found um, a good few years ago now was that the same genetic signal appears to underlie um, other repeat disorders. If this study was a study of um, spinal cerebellar ataxias caused by expanded CAG repeats. Um, and that's very interesting because that's another piece of evidence that says that those um, genetic modifiers probably act at the level of the mutation in the DNA rather than further downstream. So what do, does this information mean for those at risk and for patients, people with HD, for scientists, for clinicians and for pharma? Well, um, I'm going to deal with each of those in turn at different depths for different um, audiences perhaps. Do genetic modifiers allow us to predict disease events? Well, this is a very interesting question because in a population, they will allow us to predict what might happen in that population. But for individuals, they really don't help to predict very much at all. And I've got one piece of data that illustrates this. Um, because we, in FAN1, which was our biggest hit, the great big tall peak in our Manhattan plot, um, we know that two of our signals are what are called coding signals, and they are where the change in the gene translates into a change in the protein that it makes. And we see two of these changes, um, so amino acid arginine, changes to tryptophan and amino acid arginine changes to histidine at the 377th and the 507th amino acid of FAN1. Now we see an excess of these variants which are predicted to be damaging to the function of FAN1 in early onset patients and this agrees with the genome-wide association study that was done that showed that R377W, a single copy of this, um, confers 3.7 years earlier onset and a single copy of R507H confers on average five years earlier onset but this will be different in different people. But what you can see here is we have a number of people with late onset HD and they also carry a copy of these genes. So if we knew that someone carried a copy of 
R377W, we couldn't say that this person's definitely going to have 3.7 years earlier onset than predict that predicted by their CAG repeat. Um, because it, it doesn't work like that, because there are other things going on in the genome that can clearly influence uh, what happens here. And of course, there's that residual variation in age of onset that is not encoded by the genes. And we don't know what causes that either. So I would say that um, the genetics has potential to be useful, but it's not useful yet. We've probably defined about 25% of that residual variance, so about a quarter of what's left of the genetic variance we've probably defined. Do the genetic modifiers shed light on biology? Well, yes, they do. And I think this is, um, you know, clearly this is why I'm working on them. So what we did was a sequencing study in people with extremes of age of onset. And this was done by Bram McAllister and Tom Massey in the lab. And what you can see is we went through um, the people in the registry, European registry study actually, and we picked out those with very late or very early onset for their CAG repeat length. And rather than doing a survey of uh, variants through the genome, we actually sequenced the coding part of the genome, so the bit that codes for proteins, with the view that that was the bit where you were likely to see large effects. Changes in proteins tend to cause larger effects than other sorts of variants. And one of the things we found was that there were differences in CAG repeat structure. And this means that the um, standard um, PCR test that people use to measure CAG repeat is going to be incorrect in some people. And um, that partly accounts for the fact that you see, in, we had 19 people who had um, two CAA interruptions at the end of their CAG, so they're going to be measured incorrectly. And they had 17 years later onset on average. And then we had a number of people who had um, no CAA interruption, so they just had a pure CAG tract. And those people have um, much earlier onset, um, about 18 years earlier. So that's a huge effect. And we think that that effect is bigger than just the mismeasurement of the CAG repeat. So we're interested in why that should happen. And it's probably something intrinsic to the DNA, which we're currently exploring. So what we think is happening is that this CAG repeat related mechanism that we think we are seeing is probably to do with somatic instability of the repeat. So the repeat, as you know, is unstable on germline transmission very often from parent to child, but it can also be unstable in cells within the body. And we know that it's particularly unstable in cells of the striatum that tend to be uh, most susceptible in Huntington's disease. We don't know exactly how this happens, but what we think is that the long repeat adopts um, a non-standard DNA formation. So it makes um, lots of strange shapes and those strange shapes are recognized by the DNA repair machinery mistakenly as being errors in the DNA. So it tries to fix them and in trying to fix them, it can cause changes in length and these can be expansions or contractions but once you get beyond that 36 CAG repeats they're nearly they're generally more likely to be expansions than contractions. There's all sorts of funny shapes the DNA um, can um, take up but we don't know which ones are responsible for uh, what we're seeing but this is our current best guess. Um, so this somatic instability is um, potentially very interesting to us because it, somatic expansion in the brain, uh, Vanessa Wheeler proved some time ago, actually is associated with um, an earlier age of disease onset. So this is a person who has 47 CAG repeats and had an age of onset of 25. This person here has 47 CAG repeats and had an age of onset of 41. And this is the original inherited CAG length and this is one CAG repeat greater, up to five CAG repeats greater, up to 10 CAGs, etc. And you can see that this person has a great long tail of expanded CAG repeats, whereas this person with much later onset has a much shorter tail. And the same down here for these two people with 41 repeats. And if you aggregate all of these together, you can see that this is a significant effect. 
So it looks like um, somatic expansion in the brain might well be driving onset of Huntington's disease. And um, we know that the mismatch repair genes are part of, um, of that machinery because in mice in particular, it has been shown that if you knock out some of those mismatch repair genes, you can actually prevent the somatic expansion in the um, brains of the Huntington's disease mice. We also think there might be a vicious cycle because we think that um, you're likely to get DNA damage and repair. And if you've got a wild type allium, that mostly is not going to be affected. But the DNA is likely to flip in conformation. And as you'll get the, a very occasional alteration in size, probably really infrequent at normal um, inherited CAG lengths. But as you start to get the occasional CAG length that's expanded, then you will start to see um, more expansion because the DNA will spend more of its time flipped into a um, structure that's recognized by that DNA repair machinery. And actually we know that Huntington itself with an expansion can cause DNA damage in and of itself. So there's probably a vicious cycle going on so that eventually you get into a toxic cycle, you have a long repeat, um, you get more DNA damage, that DNA damage makes the repeat longer and you get this toxic cycle and that will give you um, increased repeat lengths. And this could be in the germline or somatically, i.e. in cells of the body that um, are not uh, germline cells, just um, in cells. And this happens in neurons, we know this, which don't divide. So we don't know the mechanisms behind this, but we're busy working on them now. And this is interesting because this somatic expansion is probably going on um, from very early on um, after conception. We don't know exactly when, but it does mean that if this somatic expansion is um, going on from very early on, we could potentially interfere with it quite early on. So it's attracted this hypothesis and the genes that we found have attracted a lot of attention. Um, and we think there might well be a two-stage mechanism here. We think that the inherited repeat length of 36 or more, which causes Huntington's disease, actually is the threshold at which that repeat is licensed to expand further in specific cells. And as it expands further, it will become, it will reach a pathogenic length. And I put the pathogenic protein in here, but we don't actually know that that's the pathogenic moiety to cells. Um, and we don't know what the threshold is um, of expansion that um, causes a cell dysfunction and then cell death. So um, we wrote an article recently where we speculated that this might be somewhere between 60 and 100 CAGs, but actually we really don't know. And it will be very useful to know because we uh, would like to know what we need to stop, what we need to achieve in order to um, generate treatments. So do the genetic modifiers help in the search for therapies? Well, yes, they do. And this is um, testified to by the fact that um, there have been a whole stack of companies, some of which be, have been set up specifically to look at um, trying to modify the somatic expansion of the repeat. Um, and some of which are large pharma companies who decided that this is a good target to aim at. So, this is about converting genetic findings to biological mechanisms, finding targets for therapies. And the genes we've found are potentially targets for therapies to get people from here to here, ideally. Now, this is a complicated diagram, but you don't need to take most of it in. This is um, a diagram of the DNA repair pathways. Even I find it mind-bogglingly complicated, I have to say, because this is not, has not been until very recently my specialism. So let's not worry about what they are, but basically we think that our expanded trinucleotide repeats are kind of um, one of these repair pathways and we know some of the members. But the interesting thing about this is that this is an oncological paper. It was written about cancers and the um, particular proteins that they've highlighted here in red are proteins for which there are um, therapeutics currently um, being made and in fact PARP 
Poly-ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors are in use as a treatment for both breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And we've used some of these PATH inhibitors in a, an experiment because we noted that we see increased poly-ADP ribose in cells um, with 109 repeats compared to cells with 22 repeats. And we looked at inhibiting this using these PARP inhibitors, and we did indeed see an effect. Sadly, we were going to look at somatic expansion in these cells. These cells show somatic expansion, and very sadly, um, we were doing this last March, and we never got the answer because the experiment had to be aborted. Um, but we did see um, that the PARP inhibitors reduced the amount of PARP in the um, HD cells. So that's just one example of how we might um, be able to tackle um, some of, or at least find out, understand the biology better of some of these um, potential inhibitors that already exist. So um, finally, I would just like to say an enormous thanks to the patients, the families, the clinicians, the researchers who made all of these studies possible to our many different funders over the years. Um, uh, particularly CHDI, who funded all of the genetics uh, pretty well. And I'd like to thank my group. Uh, this picture was taken in 2019, and I think it's probably the last time uh, we all stood together. It's very hard to get everybody together. Uh, and my collaborators, um, who um, are an important part of this work. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Jones, so much. Um, that's definitely... Well, that's Shall true. I stop sharing? Um, it's up to you. You're welcome to stop and we can do a question and answer period. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much. I think that's something that's always been interesting to me and I'm glad that there's some research on it. Like, especially for somebody who is at risk or tested, tested positive and hearing, you know, your repeat 45. And, you know, that means, oh, I've got time, I've got time. But then you see somebody, you know, not that much older than you or younger than you symptomatic. And you're like, we have the same repeat. What happened? Um, <laughs> you know, so like, why are you symptomatic and why am I not? Um, and something I've always been curious is like head injuries and the impact. So understanding now that, you know, if, you, if those brain cells die and they're being repaired and like you said, it's, it's a different expansion. Um, that makes it so interesting to me. So I'm so thankful that for you um, and for helping me understand that a little more. Um, we have a couple questions for you. Um, so the first one is, are there plans to do sequencing or look for more variants outside of European populations? So there are plans to do more sequencing, but so far we've only managed to sequence about less than 700 people. That's not very many of any population. So um, ideally, it, it would be great to um, sequence more people from all populations. I think um, sequencing... Um, you know, everybody always looks at Europeans because they're easy to collect. And it is true that there have been very good collections of Europeans in Huntington's disease as well. And there are good collections in, um, you know, the Americas. But I do think that um, there's a lot of potential in sequencing um, in other populations just because they're likely to segregate different variants. And I think that that will add detail to the biology that we can then explore. So I absolutely think we should look for more variants outside of European populations. Will we be able to do it? I think possibly, um, although not immediately, I think we'll sequence Europeans first simply because the samples are available and there are some plans to do this. Um, and I think it would be very interesting, but I do think there's a good case for sequencing other populations too. And I think that's not just true in Huntington's disease, but in many diseases where people are exploring the genetics. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. And if it comes to Canada, I will be the first on board. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question is, in the extent of the CAG expansion related to this, or is the extent of the CAG expansion related to the severity of the disease? So that's a very interesting question to which I think we do not 
currently have a very good answer. So we've mostly looked at age of onset. And the other thing that we looked at was the gap from onset to death. And that doesn't appear to be related to um, the CAG expansion. Um, it seems to, you know, to stay, to, to be roughly the same, whatever the rate of the CAG length. But I have to say that there's competing forces going on here because people with shorter repeats are going to live longer um, and they're going to start dying of other things. So it, it's quite a difficult analysis to do. Um, and I think there haven't really been good studies of the severity of the disease. And, and then when you talk about severity, you know, that, that's probably wrapping up a number of different things. One is the, you know, how people, um, there are a number of different ways of measuring this and, you know, how people decline functionally. Um, you know, one of the things that people with HD complain about the most are the behavioural symptoms. So do you consider that somebody who has some psychiatric symptoms or behavioural symptoms, you know, has more severe disease? or not? Or is it just different? And so we're very interested in the different way that Huntington's disease presents in different people and we think there may be some genetics underlying that as well and we have done um, some work on that but it only accounts for a very small amount of the um, difference in symptoms that people see. So I think there's room for a whole stack more work here um, which you know, we would hope to be doing over the years. It all takes a, it takes a long time, but um, it is well worth it. And I would encourage everybody to come forward and um, contribute their DNA to the studies that are ongoing, because eventually they, it, you know, it's likely to prove very useful because, you know, the, the power of genetics is in numbers. The more people you have in your study, the more likely you are to find things. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. And I think, you know, as an HD community, we are prone to get involved and we're hopeful and yeah. you know, quick plug that if anybody wants to do any research, here's a great topic that lots of us would benefit from. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much, Professor, for giving us your time and sharing that knowledge with us. Um, we thank you very, very much. Um, Thank you. And I hope that you, um, does repeat purity impact variant function? I don't understand the question. Does repeat purity impact variant function? You mean, does the, does the structure of the CAG repeat impact the way the variants elsewhere in the genome act? If that's the question, the answer is, we don't know. Um, but we will, we need more people, I think, to test this. But I, I think we will, um, you know, it is a question that's very interesting and we will be looking at it because we know from our studies that we can't account for all of the difference. You know, th those were really big changes in onset age. We can't account for all of that just by the fact that we've measured, the, you know, in those people, the repeat hasn't been measured properly. There's, there's clearly something else going on as well. So you know, watch this space. Yes, we will be. Thank you so much. Um, all right, well, thank you everybody for tuning in and um, experiencing that with us. Um, but right now we have a 30 minute break. So get up, stretch around. Um, if you want to participate, we have a dance session happening with Caitlin. Um, so she's gonna lead you through some steps. Again, get those juices flowing because afterwards we have um, an HD research Q&A with Professor Ed Wild and Dr. Jeff Carroll and or a caregiving Q&A with Alex Fisher, who is an occupational therapist. So we look forward to those and we will see you there. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you.